All my life you have been faithful. All my life. Well, uh, we're going to do Mike's memorial service Friday. What time? Ten to eleven visitation, eleven o'clock service here at the church. So if you want to get involved with that, uh, matter of fact, Pastor Joseph and I were on our way over. I visited with Mike Monday, talked with him. He set up. We chatted, and then uh, Friday we're heading over, and on our way there, we got the text that he was already gone to be with Jesus. These are simply earth suits, aren't they? Just good for here. That's it. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. I want, I want to share a message called He Will Settle It. He will settle it. And uh, when I say that, understand that everything that you've dealt with in life, know this, that God's going to settle some things in your life and get things right. But... Uh, Luke 16, 10 says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. I say this all the time. We don't trust people, but God gives us things to trust, uh, to be entrusted with. That if you can be trusted with little, you can be trusted with much. And let me say about much, I honestly believe that much probably has more to do with the next life than it does this life. That God has something planned for us. I've often said you're not going to get to heaven and lay up on a cloud and drink joy juice and play a harp. That is never God's intention for you. He's a father and he has a plan. And if you're a parent, you know how much you, uh, you uh, maybe expect your, your kids or excited to see your children do well or your grandkids. You know, it's just it's a good thing. And he's that way also. So whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. I think this life here has a lot to do with the little side. So I want to talk to you today about stewardship. And uh, it's such an important word. And I have to teach you. I have to help you understand this and grasp it and get hold of it. Uh, I can't expect just to say it to you. And Tommy, good to have you and Renee back. How was Colorado? Still beautiful? Come on, Jesus. Hey, man, my granddaughter sent me a message. Paul, Paul, when can I come to Texas? I wanted to send her a message. When can I come to Colorado? You know, I'd rather, well, never mind. But stewardship, you know, uh, whether it be work or, or rest or play, whatever it is. And, and sometimes to learn what it is, you've got to know what it's not. And stewardship is not abstaining from luxuries that provide pleasure. I, I have, you know, several wonderful friends in this house. And three of them this week were gone. Tommy, you, you guys, you were one of them. You and Renee gone to Colorado. Jay and Brenda gone on a cruise for anniversary. And on the other side, I saw Jimmy and and Rhonda down in uh, golfing in Mexico. And I said, you outfit, you sorry outfit, you going down. But here's the thing is, if you, sometimes you think stewardship is not getting to do that. And that's not true. I want you to take vacations. God wants you to see the world. He wants you to enjoy the things that are around. That's a, that's a powerful thing. And many have been taught that spending, and I've been in enough churches to know. That many have been taught that spending your money on pleasure items such as maybe taking your kids to a ball game, vacation, spending an evening at the livestock and rodeo, which I have seen that we got folk at ain't in church today because they are wore out from a barbecue yesterday. Mm hmm And I hope you're watching me. Uh, whether it be, uh, uh, you know, they say that's not good stewardship. I disagree with that. Uh, you know, they, I understand wasting money, but I also know investing money in your life and doing things of that nature. So this belief is due to a misunderstanding of biblical stewardship and not to result uh, of being unable to afford some things. Stewardship is not merely being frugal. I've seen, uh, I, I've been with people that are coupon clippers. Don't lift your hand. Don't look around. Look straight ahead. There is something great, isn't it, about being able to take a coupon and, and get, you know, mark off and get, I, I'm, I've turned into a golfer again the last couple of months, and one of my great joys is finding golf balls. Yeah, it's not about hitting them, it's about finding them, Cheryl. It's, and no matter how many I got, I just want two or three more. Because if I can find more than I lost, I feel like I've made money. That's clipping coupons as far as I'm concerned. And if necessary, I'll send somebody in this church into a pond late at night to dig out golf balls, <laughs> which has already happened, by the way. 
Some people are always trying to find a bargain to the point that they become obsessed with it and judgmental about others who pay more, thinking of themselves as better stewards. Interestingly, you'll find that people who are so obsessed with being thrifty are many times the people that are plagued by a poverty mentality to always feel poor. And this level of thinking keeps them from enjoying what they do have because they're so focused on what they can't afford. Now, let me tell you that I, I mentioned to you about uh, uh, the flood and how it affected my home. And it's, I got a better home because of the flood. I also want to thank God for how I was raised up because I was raised up again with a two-holer bathroom, picking cotton, uh, you know, drawing water out of a well, things of that nature. My baths were outside. You know, if you come up that way, if you're not careful, you stay that way, or you look back at it and you say, look how far I've come. Amen. And it changes and shifts your life. And don't feel bad if you didn't pick cotton. Some of you have ne you've heard this phrase and you have no idea what it means. Living in high cotton. Man, I'm living in high cotton. High cotton, Maddie, is when you can pick cotton without having to bend over. That's high cotton. And I've been places where the cotton was low. And your back hurts after picking it a while. But you get in high cotton, you can just pick and go, baby. Amen. You can move. So that's kind of fun. You know, you don't want a good picture? There you go. All right. Let me get that out of the way. Matthew 25, verse 14. Let's get into it. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey. Jesus talking. He said, who called his servants and entrusted his property to them, entrusted it to them. Now, I want to tell you, the man going on the journey, of course, is Christ who went away. Amen. He is the servants are us. He entrusted the earth and all the things we got to us. To one, he gave five talents of money. To another, he gave two talents. Another one got one talent, each according to his ability. Everybody say according to his ability. Very important. That's the key here. When he went on his journey, the man who had received the five uh, he put his money to work, gained five more, got ten. So also the one that had two made four, and the one that had one talent, of, I'm down to verse 18. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. A after a long time, the master of whose servant returned and settled accounts. How many know he's coming back? And he's going to settle accounts. And he's given some of you five talents. You're a five-talent person. Man, you got talent. I see people with so much talent, it blows my mind. Then there's them two-talent people. Hey, Amen. They got a couple of talents, and they're good with it. And then there's one talent. Now, listen, if all you got is one talent, don't get upset. At least you got one. He could have said you had no talent. Hey, Amen. If you ever sat on a bench a long time, you understand when you ain't got no talent. I was a bench setter for a little while in football. Amen. Just praying to God. Everybody else will get injured, so I have to get to go in. <laughs> Verse 20, the man who had received the five brought the other five. Master, he said to you, he, he said, you entrusted me with five. Look, I've given you five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. Five was just a few. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Connect with him. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. He didn't get upset with the two, you know, with the two guys because he only made, he doubled it. He didn't get as much as the five, but they got the same reward. So he said, good, faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent, master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man. <laughs> Isn't it funny how the one with the five and the one with the two didn't justify themselves? But the guy with the one immediately began to justify what he was doing in life. He said, I, 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 I know you're a hard man. You harvested where you've not sown and gathered where you have not scattered seed. Now, he, he, let me help you. He's lying. Because in this moment, the master gave five, and we can use the word talents or seed to the one man. He gave one two seed to one man, and he gave one guy one seed. And this guy said, I know that you harvest in where you've not planted seed. No, I planted seed. I planted it in you. I gave you a talent. I gave you two talents. I gave you five talents. I gave you ten talents. Amen. I gave you seed. So he said, I was afraid. And I went out and I hid your talent in the ground. See, here it is. Let me just knock the dirt off of it and give it back to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So the master recognized that this guy was fearful, he was wicked, he was lazy, 
He said, I knew that, uh, so you know that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so then when I return, at least I'm going to have some interest. Take the talent from him. This ain't fair. Everybody say, this ain't fair. Mm -hmm. If you want fair, that's a, that's a place for Ferris wheels, monkey poop, and sticking a blue ribbon on a pig. That's a fair. This ain't fair. He said, take the one and give it to the one with ten talents. For everyone who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him, and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you could get this message into your spirit and begin to share it with people in your world, you will change their mentality. You will affect them. Because what I'm watching right now in our world, particularly in America, is a whole lot of people receiving when they've not worked for it. Receive, and they've not used their talents for it. They've hidden it, and they're waiting on somebody else to help them. And if you could take your talent, and you'll get, and I'm not here to condemn, beat you up in any way, shape, fashion, or form. I'm, I'm probably more of a one-and-a-half talent person. I mean, when I look back at my life and how it's gone, I just see that, uh, God, you've just been so, so good to me. But the stewardship principle here is to manage resources in such a way that you increase them. This ain't about me telling you in church life to give more. This is about me telling you to take your talents and increase them. Amen. That God gave you a talent, whether it be in business, be at work, or working hard. Amen. If you've got two, make four. If you've got five, make ten. Why? Because in the parable of the talents, it didn't matter that the one with two talents didn't bring back as much as the one with five. In fact, they both received the same reward. The master's anger was at the fact that the one he gave one talent to didn't at least put the money in the bank. And we are, are all different, but we do have at least one thing in common. God's entrusted us with resources. He's blessed us with stuff. Amen. Everybody say stuff. Oh, I'm so tired of seeing storage buildings being built and stuff being put inside there. It, it's, it, it gets to you after a while. But hear me, it's up to us to manage our resources in such a way that we increase them. Our selfishness and refusal to bring our finances under his lordship is withholding his divine power and reign upon this land. God's total kingdom rule cannot be established in our hearts until we empty ourselves of personal ownership. And understand, God, I don't own nothing. Everything I got, I have to be a steward of it. The choice is ours, as the parable of the talents illustrates quickly. So listen, stewardship of possessions is the effect of God's saving grace upon oneself and his property. When God saved you, rescued you, pulled you out of the gutter, blessed your heart, you all of a sudden, you get counsel from him. I don't need 10 reasons why I ought to be a good steward. My counsel from God was simply this. When I got born again, all I had was a 72 F8 green Dodge Charger. Amen. With a, with a three-speed hearse in it. And as soon as I got saved, that car belonged to him. I was hauling people around in it. It was his car now. I didn't have a whole lot. I'm in a rented uh, Amityville Horror House. That's where I lived with my friends. You know, we had to pray the devils away from that place when I moved in there. I worked for RC Cola. I was excited about everything that I got in life, but anything I had at that moment belonged to God. I received counsel from him. And ever since then, 40 years later, he still counseled me, Jerry, everything you've got belongs to me. I'm always looking for a place to invest what I have in the life of somebody else. Whether it be my time, and let me tell you something, your time is your talent. Your time is important. You're running out of time. So take your time and invest it. Uh, Larry, I'm glad you invested time into Joseph. Amen. Because he loves building furniture now. There's so, and I ain't saying you're to blame. <laughs> but you are, you are a motivator in that moment. But see, that's important because that's stewardship. There are people in here, you've got gifts and you've never shared it with anybody. Amen. You've held it on to yourself. I would be so mad at my dad. He'd be looking down inside the hood of an engine and, and something's wrong with that old Chevrolet that he had. And I'd say, Pop, uh, is it anything I do? Oh, no, go away. Uh, teach me. My dad was one of them. He had to learn it himself, and he figured I did too. Hmm. And, and, and as I've gotten older, if I've learned anything, as my son had a, a damaged uh, uh, part of his truck. He, he busted something on it, and I said, son, we got, you got to fix it. You got to take it off. Or you, it, it was sticking out of his Ford truck, and I said, a step on it. 
And I'll just grab my toolbox and I'll just set it on his truck and just take it off. You know, in other words, motivate, help. Your time's important. Your talent's important. It's not always about your stuff. Amen. It's about the abilities that you've got in your life. So stewardship of possessions is the effect of God's saving grace. When you realize that God has saved your home, you know, when we rebuilt our home, it was about hosting people. I wanted to host people. I wanted people to come in and see it. Amen. And enjoy it. So when God gets a man with a car, when God gets a man with a truck, he gets that truck to be used in his service. He gets a man with a Harley. He gets a man with a horse. He gets a man with a hot rod. He gets a man with a handgun. Amen. That man's stuff now belongs to God. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. It's so important. Some, some seem to think of stewardship as, as a way for a, maybe a minister or a pastor to whip people and say, you got, you got to use it. I, I, I don't want to intimidate you in any shape, fashion, or form. I want you to feel free to understand that God blessed you with stuff. Amen. For you to be a steward of it. Why? It is the natural consequence of an experience with God. The natural reaction of the human heart that has been touched by this divine spirit. When you look at the disciples and you watch what they did, they abandoned their stuff. They just gave it over to God, whether it was a boat, well, whether, whatever it was. They, that one man that they found had a donkey. And he said, well, if you want that donkey, Lord, I'll give you that donkey. Amen. And they turned that donkey. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey. People, just anytime you met Jesus, it was like, Lord, I just want to release what I've got because I know you've blessed me with it. The book of Acts begins with a powerful display of God's power and authority. When you read through Acts, man, you begin to see this, this punch of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Being displayed not only in the hearts of these early followers, but also in the communities in which they live. Whole cities were affected by the kingdom's rule and reigned by the stewardship they displayed. 3,000 men get saved right off the bat. 5,000 men and their family get saved. Acts chapter 8 verse 5 says, When Philip went down to the city of Samaria, the, he preached Christ to them, and the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Unclean spirits crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. And I, I recognize and I witness this man post-Jesus. Jesus is already resurrected. And yet this man here, Philip, uh, people, devils were running, the lame were walking, and I see it. I say, God, this is New Testament. It's right now. Acts chapter 2, verse 43. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and they had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of these things uh, he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common, and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. What was the one major attitude of these early disciples that caused God to work so powerfully in their life? Was it fasting? Yes. Was it prayer? Yes. But the one thing, the one thing was that they gave up complete ownership of their lives. They said, God, whatever I got is yours. Amen. Knowing that God's complete rule and reign in their hearts would bring much deeper blessing. Now, I know since that time, we very seldom have seen that kind of move of God because it's hard for people to get in one mind. We, we, we divide it over politics. We divide it over uh, community services. We're divided over all, we divide over all kinds. We divide over football. Amen. We divide over. But to get into the gospel and understand Jesus, amen, and to get in one mind at this moment is amazing. This is the heart attitude that God is looking for in his church. Amen. If we want to see him work in us like he did in the early church, we've got to empty ourselves of our ownership. Amen. And belief. Our youth the other night in, in, uh, in New Caney during the conference, there was something that took place in that meeting that, that was mind-blowing that... It was a one mind, one accord moment in which it didn't matter about the preaching. It was about worship unto God. And, and, it, and, and they gave their time. And God moved in that building and touched the hearts, touched the minds, touched the spirit of those teenagers. And what was amazing was how the adults were affected by it. Amen. And I just heard report after report after report because of that. For us as a church... To decide, you know what, let's just get, I'm not asking any, listen, the last thing, this thing, let me just flip side here for you real quick. 
they went into such an extreme moment where they were giving up so much stuff, it bankrupted their, their, the church. And they had, to, they had to flip this thing. Communal living is not really God's uh, desire for our lives. Can I get an amen? I mean, it's not that your house and, and my house, we, you know, you've got my title, i got your title. Uh-uh. I ain't doing that. Amen. But I need to be, how do I say it right? I need to be wise over my stuff to know when to release stuff and who to release it to. Amen. Because some people get stupid. Have you ever seen somebody, somebody spiritually stupid? I mean, everything they get. They just give it away. Everything. And all the way to the point of poverty, then you got to take care of them. You idiot. Don't give away all your stuff. Amen. God bless you with it for a reason. Be wise with it. So here's some quick strategies. Amen. If I get somebody to bump the air on back there, get some air stirring in here. We're going to get some fans put in here, ain't we, Frank? We got to get some fans. I'm up here sweating. I see some of y'all dipping with your eyes, and I can promise you I'm preaching better than you paying attention. <laughs> Let me give you some quick strategy. Everybody say strategy. strategy. It's very important. Just a couple real quick. First, free yourself from the scarcity mentality. What was it the one guy that messed up? He got scared, and he hid his talent. He didn't use his talent for the kingdom. Many believers live in fear and worry. This is what made that man get in trouble. The scarcity mentality is something brought on by past memories, like growing up poor. You didn't have it. Amen. You're always trying to save stuff because you think, you know what? One of these days, I'm going to use this uh, two-foot piece of wood. Yeah. <laughs> and you save it. Amen. And you got stuff put up. It's crazy. For some, it's hard enough to think in terms of sufficiency, much less abundance. So even if the financial conditions improve, it's still hard to think outside of this mentality, this lack of it. So this thinking will prevent blessing because it prevents giving. Within the scarcity mentality, people think they have nothing to give, nothing to share, nothing to invest. There are people that I've been, I've been reading about the economic forecasters telling us that we're fixing to go down. Everything's you better start holding on to everything because we're fixing to head over the cliff here. Financially, we're in trouble. Trillions of dollars we owe China. I don't owe China nothing. The idiots at the north of Richmond. <laughs> they the ones that done it. Forecasters, authors, journalists who would have us think that our national resources are threatened, that we don't have enough national. We ain't got enough oil. <laughs> We got lots of oil. Let us drill for it. We got lots of resources. Let us go for it. Yeah. Amen. Let us use it. God's resources are inexhaustible. What God put on this earth for his people, you cannot exhaust it. It's abundant provision. Romans 5, 17. It was, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I don't want. Amen. He takes care of me. Uh, the scripture tells me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, uh, abounding in every good work. 2 Corinthians, so generously reaped. If I give, it's going to come back to me. Number two, set in motion your own increase by your willingness to decrease. There is a spiritual principle that governs life. Decrease that you may increase. It was John the Baptist that said, I must decrease that Christ may increase. It works in your life. The more, the less you, the more him. The less you, the more him. To decrease and say, God, it's about you, it's about your glory, whatever you want. So when you do it, and it's not only does this principle decrease into increase apply within tithing, but it also uh, applies to giving and investing. The only way to receive something into your hand is to open it and let go of it. Don't hold on to it. A millionaire told a story about how he got his fortune. He said it's pretty simple. I bought an apple, a five-cent apple. Spent the whole day, evening, polishing it. It stuck out from all the other apples. Sold it the next day for 10 cents. Then with the 10 cents, I bought two apples. I polished them two apples, and then I sold them. And then I sold the next group, and I sold the next group until I got, and it takes time to build wealth. But in so doing, in increments, I became a millionaire. Amen. The journey to financial freedom requires periodic seasons of decrease. Jesus said it like this, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. You'll be, uh, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Remember a couple weeks ago when I told you about a spoon and a shovel? You decide how you want it back. You want to give with a spoon, you get back. You want to give with a shovel, it comes back. Amen. It's according to how you want to be blessed. Truth, in order to be a good giver, listen to me, you must first of all 
Be a good manager of your budget and finances. If you're living beyond your means, if you are running up bills on credit cards, credit cards are not your friend. You use them. Don't let them use you. When I use a credit, I, I, don't, I don't know how to use a debit card. I've never used a debit card in my life. I don't want to know how to use a debit card. I use a credit card, and then I pay it off at the end of the month. A church uses credit cards. We pay it off at the end of the month. We use them. I refuse to be their slave. I made them my slave. Amen. Are you following me? If you do this, and if you can't handle it, young, listen to the young people. Listen, to me. cut the card up. Start carrying as much cash as you can. Use cash. It still works. I found out there are people still take it. And then if you can, and this is my joy, use the barter system. Learn to trade your stuff from other, other people's stuff. That's fun. I just, I just like doing it. I've got guns that I've traded for other guns because I don't need that gun, but I found somebody else that needed it. But I like your gun. So let's swap guns. I'll talk with y'all after church. <laughs> Listen, don't be discouraged by a season of decrease. If you're a giver, a tither, amen, save and invest in according to the Word of God, decrease as you'll see to increase. It's a promise, Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we're going to reap a harvest if we don't give up. I've been witnessing to people, sharing the gospel with people, planting seed in people's life, believing God to water that seed, and I'm waiting on it to increase. I'm waiting on folk to get saved. Listen, there's a harvest coming. There are people that will come to Jesus because you, you've been sowing seed in their life. You've been watering seed in their life. Don't give up on them. Some of them are family. I believe they're coming in in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe the prodigals are coming home. I got to believe the prodigals are coming home. I got to believe your children, my children, folk will start serving God again. You know, I just got to believe it in Jesus' name. Can I get an amen? See, the issue is we're just focused on ourselves all the time. We're focusing on you. You've spent enough time with you in the morning. Focus on somebody else and start praying for them and believe God that everything you sold into their life. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. I put money into their lives. I bless them. I've given them a place to stay, and they're still doing wrong. I, I, I got to believe they're coming in. Maddie, I pray for your mama. I do because she don't know no better. And I believe in God. I'm, God's going to get hold of that woman. Put a Holy Ghost hook in her jaw and drag her into this house. Set her by her daughter and daughters. Turn her life around. She's got too much influence. See, a lot of folk got influence. And because of that, they got talents. And you get the right people in the house. We got a boy out at the other campus. I watched him on TV the other day. He got influence. So he in the house, he got talents. So I'm telling him, now it's time for you to use your talents for the kingdom. Did I get any man? So many people think that everyone who is wealthy, they inherited their wealth. Not true. T truth is, most millionaires are ordinary people. They live a normal lifestyle. They own their own business, stay involved with the day-to-day -day work. And most successful earners are passionate about their work and are inspired to do it and do it with excellence. Successful people view what they do as their contribution to the world. Stewards know production equals fulfillment. Let me say that again. Production equals fulfillment. When I walk back here in that, in that kitchen... When I walked, I, I saw a whole bunch of people eating sausages and, 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 uh, and biscuits and, and, and getting coffee and donuts. You came in too late for that time. Amen. It was happening way back there, back in the kitchen. I mean, folk were just eating and enjoying themselves. And then I, I turned immediately and looked into the kitchen. From the, Here's the fellowship hall, everybody. I looked in the kitchen, and there were those ladies in there just a grinning because they made it possible for you to enjoy a good breakfast this morning. And what I saw was production equals fulfillment. When you are producing in life, you feel good about it. Amen. God put that inside of you. Failure to tap into your earning potential results in a, a lifestyle lack. So let me close here. I want to emphasize that God only expects you to give according to your ability. Some of us, we look around at other people and we say, wow, I wish I could give like them. You can't because that's not your ability. You've got to give according to your ability. Amen. Uh, 
it is equal sacrifice, not equal giving. It is when your total finances are brought under the Lordship of Christ that God is able to bless you in ways that you're able to give more towards the work of the kingdom. Deuteronomy 16, 17, every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God which he has given you. Let me ask you something, brother and sister. Has the Lord blessed you? Lift your hand if the Lord has blessed you. You know he's blessed you. Okay, according to the blessing of the Lord on you is how you give. That, you know, in this house, I've used the phrase, my tithing. I wrote my, a tithe check out as I sat down in the truck. That's, my, that's the training wheels as far as I'm concerned. You do what you can do. But I want to be able to give over and above that. I want to be able to bless above that. So why is it Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive? First, giving encourages unselfishness within us. It forces us to let go. Giving brings others need, needed relief and encouragement. We're going to have an opportunity to bless men and women who are going to be going down to Guatemala to build homes for those that need help. I'm looking forward to investing in them. Pastor Joseph said, Pastor, is there any way the church can help? Yes, we're going to give $500 to everyone that's going. Amen. We want to help them. I know a lot of them are raising their own money, and I think they should. Because that's their investment. But we need to invest in them also. Can I get an amen? amen? Giving forces us out of our own tight radius world. Who else can I be a blessing to? Giving keeps us from becoming too attached to material things. Don't hold on to something that's going to hell. Don't hold on to something that's going to burn. I had somebody tell me the other day, said, Pastor, I sure like your 71 Plum Crazy Purple 440 Dodge Challenger. Don't you think you ought to or let go of that? You know that you can't take that to heaven. You know what I told him? I'm going to drive it till it burns. <laughs> when God gave me that car, God gave me that car. Amen. He put it in my hand for a reason. The man that owned that car, I did his funeral. Then he said to me, Pastor, I want you to have this car. I said, I will buy this car from you. He said, okay. And then he taught me a principle. He said, it'll cost you a dollar. I gave him a dollar for that car. If you ever get a chance to buy a 71 Plum Crazy Purple uh, Dodge Challenger for a dollar, do it. <laughs> it's a good investment. Amen. I've bought that car, put that car together, put bukus of money in it. It's been in fires, it's been in floods, but in the back seat is a box with Rodney's ashes in it because his wish, his prayer is that I would ride him around in that car. And I don't know what's going to happen when I get rid of that car. I'm probably going to have to hide that box in there somewhere. <laughs> but it says riding with Rodney on the box. Amen. And I've used that car as a stewardship principle to teach people and use it to witness to people. I do the same thing with my Harleys. I did it with my horses. I've done it with everything I've got. If you'll learn to do that, then all of a sudden you hold on to things a little lightly. You have my dad's banjo. Some people think if you get something from your dad or a family member, you need to hold on to it. What good was a five-string Gibson banjo hanging up in my man cave when I know I'm never going to play it? But that young man's got talents. <coughs> He's got giftings. So I let it go. I released it, and I said, now, and hopefully, someday I'm going to hear him play it in this church. <laughs> Just saying. Giving keeps us from becoming too attached. Giving models the life of Christ. What he did, he gave. Constantly giving. Giving results in eternal rewards. What we do here matters there. Everything I've given here to someone or something, it helps me there. Giving teaches us the value of servanthood. I can't be a servant without giving. Giving makes us more cheerful, caring people. You can't give without smiling. Giving prompts greater sensitivity towards others. And giving provides an example for others to follow. I pray that when I'm dead and gone, people say, you know what? I don't know much about that preacher, but I can tell you this. He was a giver. He gave. Amen. He released. He understood generosity. 
The willingness to manage by priority will put your resources in alignment with what matters most. Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart is. Did you know how wicked your heart is? I've heard people say that dumbest things. I'm just going to let my heart lead me. You're an idiot. Your heart is deceitfully wicked. Your heart will lead you down the wrong path. Your heart will cause you to hang out with the wrong people. Your heart will get you in more trouble than you can get out of. So wherever my treasure is, my heart is. I, I have lots of stuff. I remember as a young youth pastor, didn't have a lot then. I had a man show up at my house. His son, Johnny, always in and out of drugs. And I, uh, I was helping Johnny. Very seldom could I get him in Bragg Church in our youth. But I would, I would, help, I would go out of my way. Because there's a lot of people that ain't in church that you go and do things for them. So I'd go help Johnny. And uh, this little uh, apartment I had had a sliding glass. And the father showed up. And he was riding a Honda motorcycle. 750 Honda. And it had that high bars on it, so, and uh, a black one. And he said, listen, I got this in a drug deal. <laughs> and I took it away from my son because he's got to quit doing drugs. He said, uh, you want it? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I love motorcycles. I was in my 20s, mid-20s. And I said, yeah, I'll take that. And I said, I'll use it for his glory. And so I did. I don't know nothing about the drug deal. I don't know anything about it. All I know is, is God takes things from the wicked and gives it to the righteous. I wasn't. Don't never consider myself righteous. But hey, God, if you want to call me that, I'm cool with it. <laughs> Amen. I'll take that scooter. And I put 90. When I got rid of it, I had 90-something thousand miles on it. I didn't put all them miles on it, but I put a lot on it. And I used it for his glory. Again, if God can get it through, you get it to you. I sold that motorcycle to Toby Cocker. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I'm looking at you and I realize how far back it goes. Hmm. Where your treasure is. Where your heart is. Your treasure can't be in the church. Our church is where we gather. Our treasure has to be in Christ. What we do for Jesus. When we got... Every time I do a funeral, Sister Connie, I see the, the sand ticking out of my life. I don't have so much time left. To be a good steward, to take your five talent. And he just used five and two and one. There, there are 10 talent people in here, 20 ta Some of you are so talented. And some of you yet to discover your talents. But many of us, if we're getting older, we got to use what we got. We got to be generous. We got to be wise. We got to realize I can't take it with me. Amen. And use it for the kingdom of God. Frank came out to visit me this week. Frank's the ponytail old man over here. <laughs> We're, we got a horse arena we don't use anymore. Got rid of all our horses. And, uh, and, I, and, I, and I don't want any more. I'm good with that. But I thought this arena needs to be used. So we're going to build a community garden out on the property. Frank's going to be over it. And uh, we got people that want, they love fresh tomatoes, watermelon, corn, potatoes. We're not growing no broccoli. <laughs> but we're going to start out small. But we're going to build a community garden, and we're going to give it away, and we're going to bless people with it, and we're going to invite young people and teach them how to grow a garden and, and other people to come out. I, I was brought up with a garden. And, and so let's use what we got in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. And who knows what's going to happen in life. Uh, you can grow all kind of financially prosperous crops today. I'm just saying. I didn't say nothing wrong. Y'all just terrible.
God, make us good stewards. Put your hand on our stuff. Remind us how we can bless others. And you, God, you've got people you want to add to this house. We've sold into their lives. And we believe in the name of Jesus they'll come in from north, south, east, and west. That people will get saved. And the excitement I felt in worship today will just stay and permeate in this house. The connections we've made that you help us use our time, our treasures, our talents, God, for your glory. Help us come together as a one people and we'll, so we'll see the lame walk. That we'll see eyes open and ears open. We'll see miracles in our day. God, we're not trying to pump up nothing. We're not trying to change. We just want to walk in the Spirit and believe you for the best. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Come on, give God praise. You're a great church, I'm telling you. Amen. You've blessed uh, me and so many other people in this house with your gifts and talents. Thank you so much. You have opportunity. you got an envelope there in front of you. Amen. If uh, our servant leaders are coming right now. How many remember Johnny Rollett? A man that came in here was swinging a rope. Talked about feral, feral wild. Johnny will be with us February the 17th. And hold on, that's a Saturday, and that's a men's breakfast. I didn't say gender friendly, I said men's breakfast. <laughs> Out in New Caney. Then he'll be with us that Sunday morning, the 18th of February, here in this house, and out at the other place. He's excited about coming. Do y'all remember our friend Ken Holloway? Ken Holloway helped Johnny get started in ministry when Johnny was down. He walked into my office. We got to talking, and I said, how'd you get started? He said, a guy named Ken helped me. I said, uh, Ken Holloway? He said, yeah, do you know Ken Holloway? I said, yeah, he's my best friend. Ain't no way. And I called Ken up on the phone, put him on speaker, let him talk with Johnny, and encourage Johnny. Johnny's got an amazing ministry going. He's rocking, man. He's, he's in the right place. So glad, glad to have him coming back to our house. So just encourage. Uh, that's one of them services you want to get your friends to. Amen. Johnny's good. As we give today, we're believing God for? More money, less hours. Benefits. Gifts and surprises. Finding money. Bills paid off. Settlements. Inheritance. Rebates and returns. Debts demolished. Royalties received. Favor and success to the kingdom. Sister Connie, that lady sitting next to you over there at the blonde. Is that her first time here? She didn't raise her hand, did she? And I still called her out. Uh, Lucinda, is Lucinda here? They gave her bread. They gave her bread? Oh, I'm just making sure. All right. Thank you for being here today. You, you promised me that you would.